Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot where the conversations are pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Did you bring your thinking caps? Because it's time to put them on. Because the conversation starts now. Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. How y'all doing? This is back at the spot, the place where the conversation is pointed and the guests are sharp and the responses are never dull. We're getting it in. But we're going to the top of the mountain. We're going to Colorado today. We're going to be talking to Abigail Morgan. Talk to her about some chronic pain. I'm in some chronic pain right now. I wasn't feeling good. So I'm going to ask her about that because a lot of people uh, live with chronic pain. I don't know how they do it. You know, unfortunately, my cousin OD'd on fentanyl because his pain was so bad. You know, Terrible. and yeah, and street drugs and just how do you do it? And the mindset to deal with the pain. Talk about life coaching. I told her I go hard on the life coaches because you are holding people's lives in the palm of your hand. That's no joke. Okay. And then we're going to talk about some tools and some disciplines that she's going to give us so that we can incorporate them in our lives so that we can be better and feel better. Welcome her to the edge. How you doing, Abigail Morgan? Hello, good, good, good. So excited to be here. Thank you, April. Super I fun. know, me and the brains are glad to have you because everybody is dealing with some kind of pain. Financial pain, emotional pain, physical pain. Yep. Pain the ass you know, at work. <laughs> there's, there's always some sort of pain. So number one, Tell us what planet you're from and how you land and where do you show up in the world? Well, I come from the planet of mind-body connection work. This is my passion. It's what I love to do. Like you said, I'm in Colorado. So here I am <clears throat> hanging out, working with people all over the world around their mind-body connection and um, even coaches who are wanting to build a business and use um, mind-body connection concepts so that they're not in that hustle mode. So I'm really all about bringing our mind, body, and spirit into alignment because our culture likes to teach us to disconnect in all these different ways from our own wisdom that's really stored in our bodies. And that's really where we get into the root of chronic pain and all kinds of chronic struggles that happen for people. So that's my big passion. Hopefully that answers your question, April. Well, it does answer my question, but you know, I got more. Oh yeah. <laughs> that, that's how I roll. But you know, chronic pain um, is painful, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't want to, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I don't, I'm scared of the medication. I'm scared of the drugs. I get that. But maybe sometime you got to get the edge off. Right. <laughs> but what happens is people start getting in that numbness mode. Like, I'll just use an example. So, you know, doctors and stuff don't get all bunched up. But, <laughs> you will you know, you'll have people that'll get uh, epidurals mm -hmm. or they'll get, uh, you know, they'll take codeine or right. said, whatever the situation is. And they numb it. They mask the pain. Then once that pain wears off, or once you start getting used to a certain dose, you start increasing it. What do you say to the person right now that's getting ready to grab that pill, doesn't want to, but needs to? What do you say to that person? Yeah, I would say I totally understand because I lived with chronic pain for a long, long time, about eight years myself. And wow. so I get it. Actually, the chronic pain that I had was a pelvic pain syndrome and actually two or three of them. And the pain pills did not help at all. So I understand the desire for that support. And I kind of was forced to figure out a different way. And so I do have tools that can help if you don't want to be having to taking having to take a lot of medication or you don't feel like that's the road for you. Obviously, sometimes you get a headache, you take Tylenol, life is better. But sometimes that support just isn't there for people with chronic pain. Sometimes it doesn't even exist. It doesn't help. It doesn't work. And so I have created a different avenue um, a set of tools to really work within our own mind body system to actually start alleviating the pain itself because it's so hard to live with that discomfort and you fail to realize that these pain medications make you constipated it's true <laughs> or or they give you diarrhea one right. or the other 
you know, and then then you're like, really? Who does this? Who does this? Or, you know, you get where you start self-medicating and you say, okay, let me pop a little pill for this, a little pill for that. Now let me have a beer. Oh, okay. Well, let me have a shot of tequila. And then one thing goes to, you know, from, uh, you know, hell to a handbasket. Uh, from a handbasket to hell. Well, it goes from one place to another and it's not good. Okay, so let's dial back. Um, when you started to seek out an alternative method mm-hmm. for pain, education is key, but where did you start? Well, I did all the traditional Western medicine stuff, um, but like I said, there just wasn't a lot of help for the situation that I had for my body. Um, so then I did all the alternative things like acupuncture and stuff, and that still didn't really help either. So, mm-hmm. and I'd done all kinds of nutritional things and I was starting to really have a lot of panic because I just wasn't feeling better. And so I ended up just kind of navigating through intuition to this mind body world. And a friend of mine actually handed me a book called, um, the mind body prescription by Dr. John Sarno, who is pretty well known in Western medicine now and in, in the world of chronic pain for his work. So I read his book and he didn't have anything in there about the pelvic stuff I was dealing with. So I had to start figuring out how it applied to me and if it really could help. And that really got me going down this path and it turned out to be really effective. And so I started researching like crazy and trying to figure out how to put it all together um, for me and and then for other people with pelvic pain, because I got really passionate about it. It just, mm-hmm. it was so, so exciting to think there is a way out, right? There is something that will help. Because, you know, you can't see inside your body, Mm-mm. you know. Um, and also, you have to take into consideration, sometimes, not all the time, but I say a good majority of time from my experience and what I know from people, chronic pain uh, is much deeper than that yes there's a a core there's something wrong with your core is it generational trauma Mm -hmm. is it self-loathing is it you know it's more than just you know diet or just a pain there's a root cause to that do you find that that has been true in your experience yeah for sure and that's really the work I do with people is we're digging around to find where is that individual person's core root issue or issues that are kind of bundling up and causing the body to respond. I think of the body as a messenger who's saying, Hey, there's something that needs adjusting in your mind, body, spirit, you know, system, if you want to call it that. And so that we just have to look at that messenger and say, okay, we're going to figure out what this message is and what are the things we need to address. And there's kind of like a common set of things everyone can address that starts to help and then we get into the more specific things for individuals right like like you said it could be specific generational trauma it could be something you went through individually um, but there are some kind of blanket processes that can really help a lot okay so again what give give us two or three you know that that people can really kind of pinpoint and say oh that might be you know that might be something i'm going through Absolutely. So there's some really common ones that we we kind of all share. If if you're a chronic pain person, if you've had chronic pain for a while, there tend to be some things that are um, really important to look at. So the first one is similar to what you just said, April, self-loathing. Um, it's kind of, I call it self-pressure because there's this sort of insidious voice in the mind that is hiding back there. And sometimes it's really loud that is telling you why you need to be doing things better, why you're not doing well enough at stuff, what you need to be working on, how you need to be improving, you know, all of that like constant, constant, constant voice in the head. Mm -hmm. And we're really taught to think like that in our culture. Um, Like achievement is the ultimate, right? In our culture. And so this voice is causing constant stress on your system. Mm -hmm. And that that stress, like it immediately goes into our bodies because you think about what do you do when you're tense about something? You go like this, right? Or you clench somewhere in your body. So immediately you start to get tension physically in your muscles. And the longer the body stays in that condition, which if you think about it, if you're pressuring yourself all the time, then it's going to be all the time. The longer you're holding tension, the longer that affects nerves, it affects blood flow, it affects how your tendons and muscles function together and you start to get chronic ways of movement chronic Mm -hmm. ways of being in your body that can lead to a lot of pain so that would be the first one is really looking at how the mind is creating that tension in the body 
and counteracting it. I just directly counteract it with compassionate thinking, which sometimes can feel a little bit challenging, but it's really looking and saying, instead of saying like, oh, I'm being a terrible mom, I should be a better mom or, you know, whatever the thought is going, I'm going to actually really be kind to myself about being a mom today. I'm going to switch that thinking up and make that change. So that would be the first one. If that makes sense. That makes a whole lot of sense because <laughs> my friend has irritable bowel syndrome, you know, and that's where she tightens up right in the booty, yep. you know, <laughs> and, real, and you know, her stomach, she can't eat and it's from stress. So everything you said is just, you know, right on point because you know, she's just always tense. And I'm like, okay, can you maybe dial back, look at what you're eating, you know, but it's not just the food, you know, right. how you're eliminating, maybe chart it you know, see what triggers you, what reaction that you go through. Um, cause she's, you know, she's jacked up like a soup sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, now you also do some life coaching. Yes. All right, here we go. You know, when people say that they're quote unquote life coach, there's a ton of them out there. Yes. For okay. sure. How are you, or what tools do you have to help someone better their life because you are about how let me guess you're anywhere between 30 and 40 yeah I'm actually 45 (laughs) well you're looking good girl you ain't stressed (laughs) okay you're 45 years old yeah you're a white woman you live in Colorado yeah you you know you you got a certain lifestyle then you run across a 60 year old black woman that's a podcaster that's going through hell. Mm-hmm. What tools do you have in correlation with life's experience that can yeah. really help me better my situation? Because it's a lot. You're talking about culture, talking about location, talking about age, talking about uh, you know relationships. All of that comes comes into the fold when you're trying to help somebody better their life. How do you throw a love blanket over that and make me feel better? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I totally get what you're talking about. And the the one thing that I do that's probably a little different than a lot of life coaches is I'm really working with the body mm-hmm. because we all have a body, right? And our bodies are the biggest key to shifting in whatever way you're trying to shift, whether it's releasing pain or feeling better emotionally or just, you know, whatever changes you want to make. So the love blanket that I like to bring to my clients, wherever they live and whatever they're up to, it has to do with the nervous system that we have in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so our nervous systems are talking to us all day long, but they're really cool because they're protecting us. They're always protecting us from potential danger or things that could, could remind us of the past. Right. So like you mentioned, generational trauma, the things that we may have gone through that are traumatic in our own lives are actually going to be kind of present in our nervous systems and our nervous systems are going to go, Hey, Ooh, that's reminding me of that. We got to, we got to watch out. We're going to go into fight or flight now. We're going to be, you know, in in that zone of adrenaline flowing and all that stuff. So there's this really fast, simple thing you can do to help your nervous system really release fight or flight and go into what we call more of a social engagement state, which is like that feeling of, oh, what now I feel like I can laugh. I feel like I can smile again. You know, if I've been under stress, now I feel like there's a little bit of relaxation in my body. I feel like interacting with my friends rather than hiding away and stressing out. And the quick thing to know about this is our nervous systems don't understand words. So they can only understand more of a tactile sensory type language. So this is where we do something super silly and fun, which is you get either like a little teddy bear or something soft or something cuddly or a blanket, or even just think about something like, yeah, that's perfect. (laughs) Perfect. For me, I think about sitting on a couch with a cup of tea or something, getting cozy, you know, think about a fire. It's warm. Yeah. I I got got it all right here. So I should. You are set. (laughs) And I have a little stuffy that I like too. Okay, so talk about social anxiety too. Mm Because there's a lot of people that just go off, you Mm -hmm. know, for a variety of different reasons. What I suggest, and I'm not, you know, trained professional like Abigail is, but number one, 
stop. Just stop. You know when you are going from a flicker to a flame. You you know it. Your your heart starts to race. Your your breathing uh, syncopation starts to go different. You know your eyes may buck. You, you may twitch. You may twirl your hair. Whatever the situation is, you know when you've been triggered. Okay. Yeah. Just take a breath and count backwards from five. Five all the way down to one. Allow yourself that time to decompress because it's about how you respond. That's what Abigail said. It's all about your response. Fear is here for a reason. It is here to signal you. It is here to teach us a lesson. It's here for caution. But you don't have to stay in a fearful state. And you don't have to get defensive when you're afraid. Defensiveness and protectiveness are two totally different things. And so what Abigail is saying is, you know, 100% on point because you've got to know what's triggering this inside of your body. Mm -hmm. And then do some, like I do, uh, get my little love puppet and a <laughs> cup of tea and sit my butt down and think about it and process it. Is this really worth the response that I'm giving it? Am I overthinking it? Do you consider the other person's point of view if that's the situation? Do I notice that every time I'm in a certain person's presence, I get this knot in my stomach? You know, how can we reframe that? Do you do any NLP, any neuro-linguistic programming in your work? Not specifically. No, I don't do NLP. I'm not trained in it. So I wouldn't feel like, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take a course in it because it's how you talk to yourself. It's that subconscious mind that neuro-linguistic programming, because what I'm afraid of, again, with life coaches, not you in particular, but is that that's a crutch. Right. You know, <laughs> that's that cigarette. That's that joint. That's that beer. This is the person that I need to hold me up. I want to be able to separate myself from Abigail and April and be able to walk on my own. And a lot of times people don't do that. It's like talk therapy. Bless my girlfriend's heart. She'd been talking to the same uh, therapist for 15 years and lived through the trauma for 10 years. You're still there 25 years later. Yeah. I'm not, you know, like I said, I'm not knocking. Oh, it's a great therapist. Really? And still got you coming for 15 years? Give me some tools that I can anchor myself. And I'm yeah. not saying that, you know, to anybody that's going through therapy or need it. If you need it, get it. But what I'm saying is, is that all that you need? Are there other options that you could look to? What do you think, Abigail? Yeah, that's exactly, the, I think that's the most important part of coaching, actually, and the work that I do specifically. It doesn't even work unless the client is using the practices at home for themselves. And the whole goal is to get it to where they're doing that and they don't need any support. Because we we the only way we feel safe, really, it, when we're faced with our own triggers and our own fears and all of that, what you're just talking about is if we really trust our access to our, to our own strength. Right. And that's, what's going to give us that sense of who I got this, no matter what the situation is, you know? So like that exercise of grabbing your stuffy, you're noticing how the sensory feeling of comforting objects tells your body it can calm down. And right. so now you've got a tool you can do anywhere, anytime, you don't need your coach, you don't need your therapist, you don't need anyone to navigate a hard situation. I think that's absolutely vital, especially if you're trying to relieve pain, because you got to have that way to, to help yourself in the moment. I have an alternative superhero. Oh, yes, I do. There she is right there. You can tell I oh, love, I love it. <laughs> you know, and let, let me bring it so you can meet her. This offsets all of my worries. This offsets all of my drama. I love it. <laughs> because what I do is I say, hey, you know what? Let me shift this. Um, and it's a fantasy that I create in my mind, but it works. Mm -hmm. It's about distractions. If you can have a negative distraction, you can have a positive distraction. So true. Any parent knows that trick, right? <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. And so offsetting that. That is so important. Okay, so you got a client and now you are seeing some change. Mm -hmm. You're seeing some growth and 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 um and and you're really seeing that they're excited about what they're doing. 
How do you keep them on that trajectory? How do you keep them on that high? Ooh, yeah, that's fun. I kind of think of this as icing on the cake coaching. I think it's really important to stop and reflect when you're in that place of this is working, I'm on that high, and actually keep a journal of all of the things that are feeling good right now and all of the ways that you notice that things are working, because that will just keep that thing moving towards the the trajectory of success. So I, I give that assignment to my clients a lot to just write down daily what's working, what's working, what's working, because that will keep it going. And that's super exciting. That's good. And you can look back on it and reflect and say, oh, wow, this yeah. is where I was three months ago. And look at the accomplishments that I made. Documentation exactly. is key. What do you say to the person that's dealing with the imposter syndrome? You got this high profile executive woman, one of your clients, she's going and blowing, you know, she's making six high six figures. She's looking good. She's got the, you know, the weight down. She's got the, the suit. She's carrying the designer bag, but then she goes home and she hates herself. Mm -hmm. What do yeah. you say to her? Well, this is where I think it's connecting to our own inner wisdom that can really shift that. Because we get all this cultural garbage around us, right? And stuff that's being taught to us that doesn't really align. And if you can find your own source of wisdom again, it will shift that imposter syndrome because we're no longer trying to focus on everyone around us and what do they think of us and are we good enough for them? It's really that rooted feeling of, I know my own truth. I feel who I am. And now when I walk into a situation, I know what's important to me what my values are, what my wisdom is saying, rather than trying to figure out what, what to do to, to please everyone else, right? Which is really kind of where that imposter thing comes in. So to thy own self be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So now, do you deal mostly with women clients or men or both? Mostly women, but I do have some men. Yeah. Because a lot of my clients deal with women only, and that's kind of disheartening because it seems like women are so troubled. But no, we are more emotional and we are more open to speaking out. So you have a male client that comes to you um, mm -hmm. and he's kind of closed in. Yeah. You know, he wants help, but he doesn't know how to ask for it. He's not a good communicator. What would be some suggestions that you would tell him as a life coach, how to open up? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of the men that I work with are coming because they have chronic pain, right? So this first well, step- why I sent them, huh? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so the first step um, is really just acknowledging what our culture does to men, which is telling them not to feel, right? And telling them to bottle everything up. And like the only acceptable emotion is anger or sexuality, right? For men. Mm -hmm. So just really creating that kind of permission space to have all the feelings, doesn't mean they have to be expressed to other people. They can just be expressed to ourselves, right? So that's kind of the first step. And that it's not it's not wrong. It's not, um, you know, less masculine or whatever to, to have emotions in our bodies. Right. right. Because again, they're taught to, you don't cry, you know, right. well, don't do that, toughen up, this, that, and the other. And then right. if they do the exact opposite, then you're soft, then you're weak, then you're vulnerable. Yeah. But I'll tell terrible. you something, men, women like a man that's, <laughs> okay i don't want to see you crying uh and your mascara running like mine but i do but i do want to connect with you to know that you are sensitive they yeah. know that you show your emotions that mm -hmm. you do feel that that to me that's kind of a turn on exactly for sure 100 percent. all right so now let's ask some fun questions about okay. Abigail morgan <laughs> you live there in colorado What's the best thing about Colorado? What would just when if I was coming there and I've never been there before, <clears throat> what's one of the best things about living there? Mm, to me, it's the nature. There's just easy access to nature, like hiking trees, lakes, rivers. Like I even in the city where I live in Fort Collins here, you can just walk down and get on a path and you're by the river in the trees. You know, to me, that's mm -hmm. fantastic. I thrive on that. So what about the big. football team? You happy about your football team? I'm not a big football fan, so I just oh. don't really care. <laughs> I know. Oh, I love all that crunching and bumping and booty slapping. And yeah, I, oh, that, yeah, that's a stress reliever for me. It's a good football game to see that aggression taken out another kind of way. Awesome. If you were an appliance in the kitchen, what appliance would you be and why? Oh, man, I'd be the microwave because I love just getting things done. <laughs> really? You just want to just 
Get it in and get it out? Yep. <laughs> I'd be the tea kettle. Would you? Yeah, I like it hot and I like to spout off. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, if you were an animal, what animal would you be and why? Oh my gosh, I've always, whenever asked that question, I always say golden retriever. And now I actually have two golden retrievers. I just, oh. I'm just a person who likes to play and I like to connect. And so I'm just like, I'm always wagging my tail kind of. Oh goodness, I'd be a party animal. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to get it in. Oh yes, mother has lived, honey. Yes, yes, she has. <laughs> what brings you to tears? What makes you cry? Oh, good music can do that for me, for sure. Um, or like just, especially if something that like my child is going through that's rough, that'll do it for sure. What uh, What are some of the things that you tell your child with regards to the world? Because it's different when you, from when you were that child's age, the way people look, the way they feel, the way mm -hmm. the earth is, the politics. Um, your child is going to have to morph into all of this. What kind of advice do you give? Is it him or her? She's a girl. She's 10. Oh, oh boy. 10. That's a tender age. I know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We're just starting to get into kind of stuff, you know, the world stuff. I tell her a lot of the same things that we've talked about already, like focusing on not being hard on herself and really focusing on what her truth is, um, because that's where she can stay steady rather than get pulled in all these directions. Right. Because that so device that Social device media. is something else is really something else is exactly. you feel bad as a parent if you take it away mm -hmm. you know you feel like it's a punishment but the things that pour over that screen is Ugh. i yeah. opened up one of my emails and if i saw something i had never seen before they were doing the most and i'm like this is just a regular email you know sexuality and you know all the hate and the body dysmorphia and Ugh. Oh. It, it's really tough. It's really, really tough. Yeah. Do you work with, you know, well, I know that some of your uh, clients, do you help them also in that life coach, help them deal with some of the things that the challenges that they're dealing with their children? Do you talk to them? Yeah, about sometimes that? that comes up for sure. Yeah, definitely. That's, That's good. Yeah. It's part of um, a lot of the stressors that come through for people, right? Because parenting can be big. So you have two golden retrievers. I do. <laughs> Why do you love that dog so much? That <laughs> just, dog. They are full. Of, they're a year and a half. They're just full of life. And they're so loving. They're just the sweetest. Like if I start crying, the, the boy retriever will come over and just sit on my lap. Oh. And he just is like one of those therapy dogs. It's so sweet. <laughs> they are sweet. They are. I, I love, uh, I love dogs, but you know, dog is God spelled backwards. It's and true. There's mm -hmm. something about that puppy love. <laughs> it, it, it's unmatched. It's unmatched. so true. What, what's the best thing you know how to cook? Can you cook? I am. I love cooking. Lately, I've been doing a lot of soups, but I think my best thing is lasagna. I, I make a mean lasagna. Okay. Do you? All right. Well, we'll have to swap some recipes. I was thinking about doing some soup too. If you had three wishes, Abigail Morgan, what would they be? Ooh, that's fun. I haven't thought that way in a while. Let's see. I would wish for my child to have like just the best life possible. That would be a big one for me. Um, and then um, I would wish for a retreat center that I could um, run all out of here in Colorado for women who are struggling with either pelvic pain stuff or, you know, other things that they want to come and get support around. Um, that would be really cool. Really cool. And then lastly, um, probably a little bit more um, chance to do music in my life. I play violin. I'm a violinist, a professional violinist. So wow. any more ways to bring that in would be really great. You know, <laughs> my mother called it a fiddle. She used to say, I hate that fiddle. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, but mama, you haven't explored it. So what I did was I turned her on to new style of playing the violin and it is hip. It is taking on a lot of contemporary. I love classical and it's no joke. So do you have an acrylic one or you have a wood one or you have a couple of them? I have, I do have two. One is kind of like just a family violin that's been in my family for generations. And then I have one that I um, got as a gift to go to college with. Oh, and that was from wow. my parents. And it's a, a wood 
It's 120 years old. It's a violin that's very, you know, high quality and amazing. I love it. Her name is Anne. <laughs> and, yeah, see, I named my stuff too. Uh, and I think that that's beautiful. If, if somebody was there in your retreat center and you pulled out your violin and just, you know, let them close their eyes and they had no idea that that was coming, that, would, be that would just kind of set a vibe and it would, you know, it would just be perfect. So again, yeah. I always put the call out. Brains, you got a big office space that you are not using that you can, you know, contact Abigail. She wants to do the right thing. She wants to create a place for people to heal. Mm -hmm. That's what the world needs now is love. We need to heal. Can you close and tell us a little bit about any current offerings that you have, how to contact you and a couple words of wisdom? Sure, that sounds good. Well, I do have my Mind Body Magic Life Coach Training Program, which is for coaches or people who aren't coaches yet who want to work with clients using these mind body um, uh, alignment tools. So that's running right now. It's open right now. Um, I also do one on one coaching. So that's always an option as well. And you can reach me at Abigail, which is A B I G A I L, at abigailmorgancoaching.com. Um, and out on social, I'm always in the DMs as well. So those are easy ways to get hold of me. Words of wisdom. Um, don't forget to play every day in some way. I think that's one of the most important things for our nervous systems and our spirits. Well, I say get you a plushie. There you go. <laughs> get you a cup of tea. <laughs> Tune into your advice and listen to Abigail Morgan. Thank you so much for being here with me on the edge, the place the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. And we get it in because we're serious. We got a bunch of toys that we play with all the time. But what we don't play with is your mind. Thank you, Abigail. You're the best. Thank you so much, April. All right. Bye, brains. <laughs>